All right, good morning once again. Welcome everyone. If you're new with us, especially, it's good to see you this morning. And welcome to Calvary. Can I help have you open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 14? If you're new with us, we are working our way through John's Gospel here at Calvary. And uh, several weeks ago in our study, we uh, came to chapter 14. Now, let me stop here since uh, I was gone for a couple weeks recovering. Uh, let me just stop and give you the context. We are currently, as we come to John 14, in the final hours of Jesus' life before the cross. At this point in John's Gospel, the scene is in an upper room somewhere in Jerusalem where Jesus and his disciples have just finished celebrating the Passover meal together. After Judas had left the room to carry out his betrayal of Christ, Jesus launches into one final teaching to encourage his disciples and um, to encourage them and prepare them for what was coming. Um, he knew what was coming and he wanted to prepare them for what was coming. And the Lord prefaces this teaching with a command. Verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. As we pointed out last time, this command by Jesus that his disciples' hearts not be troubled any longer. And um, it's a good... Uh, I'm so sorry. No, that's... <laughs> maybe we can... As I always say, if that's the Lord, tell him I'm doing my best. Uh, maybe we can all silence our phones if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> all right, let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> Technology troubles me at times. It really does. But anyways, as we pointed out last time, this command by Jesus that his disciples' heart not be troubled any longer, uh, they were already troubled. Uh, he knew that, and the Greek word means greatly agitated with fear and anxiety, it wasn't surprising why they were troubled. He had just moments earlier told them one of his apostles was a traitor. We knew it was Judas. They didn't know it at the time. Who was going to uh, betray him. Uh, also that Peter, no doubt the strongest of the disciples and the unofficial uh, second in command of uh, the other disciples, Jesus said would deny him not once but three times. And then on top of all of that, the great bombshell was uh, the heaviest blow of all, he revealed that he was going away, and they couldn't go with him. John 13, verse 33. And so, guys, this becomes the context that caused fear to grip the disciples' hearts and led Jesus to his admonition, let not your heart be troubled. Now, after commanding them to stop being troubled, Jesus quickly follows that command with a promise. That was designed to comfort their hearts. Verse 2. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will also come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. As we said last time, this statement by Jesus is both a prophetic and a cultural application attached to it. And he purposely presents it this way to intertwine both of these ideas, the prophetic and the cultural. He brings, speaks it in such a way as to, uh, to dovetail these two ideas uh, with each other, and together they result in one very comforting promise. Now, last time we studied the prophetic application, and uh, that was in our second main point of our outline. Very simple outline. The context, we looked at that. Then the controversy. We studied that last time. You may not realize it, but Jesus' words to his disciples in John 14, verses 2 and 3, is the first place in the New Testament where the rapture is alluded to. I've labeled this point in our outline the controversy because there are many professing Christians who don't believe in the literal rapture of the church. They either believe it's allegorical or they believe that what's in view and what some Christians like myself refer to as rapture verses in the New Testament are in reality verses that really have Jesus' second coming in view. In our last study, in fact, in John's Gospel, we brought this up. And uh, we said, how do we know that Jesus is talking about the rapture here in John 14 and not uh, his second coming? It is because this promise is in keeping with Jewish wedding customs. 
which is how most Christians view this passage in John 14, okay? Uh, and the reason that most Christians see Jesus' words as a reference to Jewish wedding customs is because, well, they are. They are. What they try to do, though, is they try to tie these customs and what Jesus says here to a second coming and not to the rapture. And I believe this is incorrect, and we'll see why in our study today as we look at the cultural application of this passage. Now, guys, we are 2,000 years and half a world removed from the events that Jesus was addressing uh, in the upper room that night. To properly understand and apply Jesus' teaching on the rapture of the church, using something the disciples themselves as Jewish men were very familiar with, which was Jewish wedding customs, well, we need to understand what those customs entailed. So a lot of Christians who read their Bibles and don't understand the Jewishness of what they're reading. And so they automatically want to interject Western life, Western thought, principles. And, and as we're going to see today, they often badly miss the true interpretation of what is being said. Hold on to that thought. We'll come back to it. But if we're going to really understand what Jesus was getting at, and all he was saying and promising his disciples back then and us today, we need to understand Jewish wedding customs. Now, there were several steps or stages that were involved in, in the typical Jewish marriage, wedding service, and so on. First of all, I want you to understand that weddings were a big deal back in the first century, back in first century Israel, a major social event. It was different back then than it is today. Uh, community was very important to them. They depended on each other. And as such, they were very close to one another, community speaking. We're not so much for us today, we're very independent. But they really depended on each other. So when one member of the community was going to, a family will say, was going to celebrate the wedding of their son and daughter, the whole community got behind it. It was a big deal, a big deal, all right? Most of the weddings back then lasted a week. That was typical, all right? If the family was wealthy, they could go on a couple weeks. If they were royalty, it could go on longer. And again, to fully appreciate the spiritual lessons that we can glean from a Jewish wedding, we need to understand the stages that were involved in a typical Jewish marriage. The very first step in the marriage, Jewish marriage process was known as the Shadukin. The Shadukin. The Shadukin refers to the choosing of a bride for a son, father choosing a bride for his son. Again, most marriages back then were arranged by the father of the groom. A typical example of this would be found in Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 to 4, where Abraham wanted us a wife for his son Isaac. All right? And so he sent someone to get a wife for him. If you study that passage, um, where Abraham makes arrangements for his son Isaac's wedding by sending his eldest servant, Eliezer, which means comforter. Hold on to that. To go back to his hometown, because now Abraham is in Canaan. And this was pagan territory. And he wanted to, a servant to go back to Mesopotamia, where he was from, to Abraham, to choose a wife for his son, not from the pagans of Canaan, but from God's people back in his hometown. Or the Chaldees. Well, the father usually had the responsibility of choosing a bride for his son personally. It was usually personally done by the father of the groom. If it was not possible, as in Abraham's case, it was acceptable for the father to delegate this responsibility by designating a representative called a shotkin, which means a marriage broker or matchmaker. Now, after a potential bride was found, the next thing to happen was the kaduba. Kaduba means written, written. The kaduba was back then and still is today in Jewish culture the marriage contract, the marriage contract. Before the marriage contract could be signed, the father of the groom would negotiate the dowry, also known as the bride price, with the father of the bride. A portion of the bride price would go to the bride to use as security in the event she was widowed, first of all, or divorced. Now, in that culture, a woman could barely divorce her husband for any reason, 
A man, he could divorce her for almost any reason. All you did was write out on a piece of paper, I divorce you, hand it to her, she was gone. Terrible thing, right? Well, the fathers of these gals decided that, look, we have to give part of the bride price or the dowry to the girl, lest her husband, well, if he dies, that's not his fault, obviously, but if he ups and just divorces her, she needs to have some means of, of support. So in that regard, the part of the dowry she got was basically alimony in advance. Alimony in advance, right? The remainder of the bride price went to the bride's father to compensate him for the fact that, unlike a son, his daughter wouldn't be able to carry on his name, no longer help with labor on the family farm, or take over the family business when he retired. After all, they figured, this is them talking, not me. After all, they figured these dads of these gals, uh, he had spent a lot of money over the years raising her. Think of food and clothing. Name a couple expenses. And this dowry would help him recoup <laughs> some of his expenditures. I'm sorry, girls, that's how they saw it. All right? I'm not advocating for it. I'm just telling you what was going on. Now, after the dowry or bride price was agreed upon and a down payment was given, a contract would be signed to validate the agreement. After the, that, the couple, in preparation for the betrothal, would separately immerse themselves in a ritual cleansing pool called a mikvah, a mikvah a ritual purification pool which sig signified they were now spiritually pure and ready to enter into this most holy union. At this point, the next part of the marriage process would take place known as the eruzin. eruzin. The word eruzin means betrothal, sometimes called the kedusha, which in Hebrew means sanctification or to be set apart. And that word would really, really define the purpose of the betrothal period, a time in which the couple is set apart, set apart from everyone else, all other potential mates, to prepare themselves to enter into the exclusive covenant of marriage with each other. At this point, the couple would stand together under what was known as a hoopa, a canopy and publicly, and publicly exchange vows. This was considered the wedding ceremony, all right, as we think of it. This was considered the wedding ceremony. While under the hoop of the couple would exchange objects of value like rings, and a cup of wine was shared to seal the betrothal vows. At this point, the couple was now considered legally married. So much so that if they later decided to break things off, they could only do it through a formal divorce. Or if one of them should die during the betrothal period, the other was considered a widow or a widower. That's how strong this bond was. They were married. During this period, even though the couple was considered legally married, the marriage wasn't consummated and the couple didn't live together. You see, in Jewish culture, even though the couple was now legally married, they knew, these young folks knew, they couldn't live together or consummate their marriage until he, the bridegroom, went to his father's house and prepared a place for them to live known as the bridal chamber. In those days, the couple would live with his parents on their property. Why? Because that's where his inheritance was, his land that he would someday inherit from his dad when his dad passed on. So that's where they were going to live. That's why he went to his father's house and um, prepared this place. And so during the betrothal period, he would prepare this place for them to live, and he would do it simply by adding on to the father's house. Uh, maybe you've seen pictures in biblical encyclopedias of, of what this kind of looks like. Uh, usually uh, it, there's a courtyard, and in the middle is a well where the family would, would draw water, animals would be watered, and so on. And then you had the main house, which originally was the father and mother's house. That's where they lived, right? As the sons grew up and, and married, they would build additions onto this house, and eventually you would have the courtyard kind of encircled with these dwelling places. That's what they were called. 
In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus said. I'm getting ahead of myself. I didn't want to go there yet. Um, so for the next year, he was off at his Father's house building uh, or preparing this place for them to live. Now, the bride herself was not, uh, uh, was not uh, taking it easy during this time. She was busy uh, preparing wedding garments for her guests, preparing for the day, wedding day. And among other things, uh, that were, they were, she was preparing, sewing, and putting together were these wedding garments, as I just said, uh, which were given to guests as they entered into the wedding feast. Now, this becomes very important when you remember the parable Jesus told in Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. Remember how this father threw a big uh, feast, wedding feast for his son, invited all these guests, but they didn't want to come. I'm too busy. I just bought some property. I, I, I got some new oxen. I need to test them and so on. So the guests that were invited didn't come. So eventually the, the father said to his servants, go out into the highways and byways and just invite anyone who wants to come to come to the wedding feast. It's all ready, ready to go. And so as the father's walking through the, 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 the hall, I guess, we would call it a hall, where all these guests were seated, he noticed one guy wasn't wearing a wedding garment. And he said, friend, how is it that you've come here without a wedding garment? And he was silent. He told his servants, bind him head and foot and throw him outside. You read that and go, well, whoa. I mean, here's a guy on the street walking somewhere. And, hey, come on over to the wedding feast. He comes and now he's kicked out because he, he, he didn't have the proper garment on. No, the issue was a garment was provided for him, but he refused to wear it. He refused to wear it. Nobody gets into the wedding feast in heaven that is not wearing the special wedding garment. It's called the royal robes of Christ's righteousness. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, as he's gone preparing this place for them to live, of course she was going to miss him. And uh, she was troubled that he had to leave her. But he would encourage her by telling her something to this effect, Honey, I'm going to go and prepare a place for us to live. That's true. I'll be gone for a while. But I will be back. I will be back to get you, and then we will never be apart again. This promise, guys, in Jewish culture was known as the matan. It was also called a bridal gift. A matan amounted to a pledge of his love for and commitment to his bride. Its purpose was to be a reminder to his bride during their days of separation Reminding her of his love. Reminding her of his love that he would be thinking about her every single day they were apart and that he would, absolutely would return. A sacred, solemn promise. He would return to receive her as his wife to come get her. But guess what? When he finished the bridal chamber, the tr the uh, tradition was that the man didn't have the right to say, well, I'm finished, I'm going to get my bride. Oh, no. Oh, no. That right was reserved for his father, who alone had the authority to say when the bridal chamber was totally finished, all right? And as such, when the son could go get his bride. This meant the bridegroom couldn't give his bride a date when he was coming back to get her, since that was his father's right to determine. All he could say to her was, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now she knew he, it was the dad's you know, right to tell him when he can come get his bride. But he was basically saying to her, honey, I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know, you know I can't tell you when I'm going to be back because only the, my father knows when I can come back to get you. All I can promise you is I will be back. I will be back. Now, don't you know, think about this, right, you dads. Don't you know that these Jewish fathers were kind of rascals when it came to this? I mean, the son would get everything all done. He'd be all excited, been about a year, right? He's married. He wants to go get his, his wife. He'd be all excited. Dad, it's done. I'm finished. Can I go get my bride? And, you know, the fathers, they'd kind of walk around and say, you know, well, son, I, I really don't like the way you hung this door. Come on. 
Over here, you can put a little more effort. Come on, it's your bridal chamber. Give me a living here with your bro. Okay, Dad, okay, okay. And he'd run around trying to fix everything, making it perfect. Of course, that led to the bridegroom coming for his bride. Now, there was a liaison in Jewish culture appointed that would keep the bride updated and take messages back and forth between the bride and the bridegroom called the friend of the bridegroom. The closest thing we have in our culture is the best man, although the roles are, were not the same. Okay, They had this liaison. Uh, called the friend of the bridegroom, who uh, was, would send messages back. She was not to go see him, okay? And he was too busy fixing this bridal chamber to go see her. I mean, I don't know if that's where our custom came from, where the groom can't see the bride on the day. That, I don't know. Maybe, okay? All as I know is she was not allowed to go where he was, and he didn't have any time to hang out with her because... You guys understand, right? He wanted to get everything done so he could move his bride in. So this liaison, the friend of the bridegroom, would kind of pass messages back and forth. And he would keep an eye on the progress of the bridal chamber and send progress reports uh, back to the bride and her bridesmaids on how the work was progressing. Because of his input and encouragement. Now, of course, months would go by. It wasn't a big deal. The, the, the girls knew he was working on this addition to the father's house, right? But um, they knew it was getting kind of close because the friend of the bridegroom would say, oh, he put the roof on today. Oh, he's hanging door. You know, and they kind of knew things were getting close now, right? And so he would now start to encourage the gals because they're tired. It's been a year, right? Uh, it won't be long now. Stay vigilant. Keep watching. He'll be coming soon is the idea. The women knew it was going to be a day at that point. Even though they didn't know the exact day and hour, they know it was getting close. His return was soon. That was the custom of those Jewish fathers <laughs> to wait until the middle of the night. And then for the father to wake up his son and say, son, son, wake up. And I'm sure he didn't have to shake him. I mean, you know, the kid was ready. Son, wake up, it's time. Go get your bride. When the father told his son it's time, go get her, well, the groom would jump out of, I'm telling, probably literally jump out of bed and would quickly round up his closest friends and they would go running through the streets of Jerusalem or whatever village they lived in with shouts of joy and excitement. It's a big deal, especially if you understand the cultural significance. It was customary for one of the groom's men to go, a ho go ahead of the bridegroom, leading the way to the bride's house. And when he got close enough to shout something along these lines, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Which would be followed by the blowing of the shofar, or the trumpet. Again, guys, it was the job of the bridesmaids to be watching for the bridegroom's coming. They were getting progress reports, as I just said, and knew about when he was going to be coming for her. And when it looked like it was getting really close in the next two or three days, they began to hold what we would call a candlelight vigil. Of course, they were using oil burning lamps, which you understand. Now they're staying up day and night. They're not really sleeping because they, it's going to be a matter of hours, right? Any time now. The bridesmaids made sure their lamps were ready and they had enough oil in them because they knew it was the custom of these Jewish dads to wait until the middle of the night. So they needed to be ready. Any bridesmaid that wasn't ready when the bridegroom came, I mean, if she fell asleep or she ran out of oil, well, that was a giant, you, talk, talking about just custom, okay? That was huge. It was huge. She was excluded from the wedding feast. This, again, this was very important to the community. It must not was very important to her. She fell asleep, which means she's not all that interested. Uh, she didn't take the proper precautions and preparations. She didn't make sure she had enough oil. So it seems like she doesn't really care. Is the, that's what they were thinking. So she was excluded from the wedding feast, right? And she bore the, the shame of that. Now, I'm not saying they ostracized her for the rest of her life or anything, but for a while, I mean, not being able to enter the marriage feast with the rest of the community, 
was huge in that culture. It was a real black eye. It was just a shame uh, for that, at least that one feast. You were now a social outcast, uh, unworthy to enter in, and so, you know, it was a pretty big deal. Now, the father has just told his son, it's time, go eat your bride. He quickly rounds up his best friends, right? And they go running towards her house. They're blowing trumpets and they're shouting. And when they get to her house, they storm her house and listen, snatch her away. It was literally an abduction. An abduction. This became known as the Nisuin. The Nisuin. The final step in the Jewish wedding custom called the Nisuin actually means to carry, to carry. He would carry her back to his father's house to the bridal chamber where the marriage was consummated. After the marriage was consummated, he would emerge from the bridal chamber with his bride by his side to the shouts and applause of the people uh, that uh, were all present, her family, his family, friends, the whole community. This would be the first time she would stand beside her husband and be officially presented as his wife. The pinnacle of this joyful celebration was the marriage supper. The marriage supper. Now, it's more than just a reception. We think of, yeah, 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 marriage supper. I've been to many. You've been to an American reception. Different from a Jewish wedding feast. Okay? Um, this was not just a sit-down dinner for the guests. It included seven full days of food, music, dance, and celebration. After this week of celebration at the marriage supper, the groom was free to bring his bride to their new home to live together as husband and wife in the full covenant of marriage. Now, of course, guys, all of this parallels the stages of the marriage of the church to her bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Uh, Zach, maybe you could have the kids just a little bit. They're having fun. Good. Again, all of this parallels the stages of the marriage between Jesus and his bride, the church. First of all, the Shadukin. Remember, this was where the father arranged the marriage of his son by choosing a bride for him. The Bible says that we have been promised to the Son, chosen to be his bride by the Father from the foundation of the world. Check out Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. Next, the Kaduba. This was where the price was settled upon that the bridegroom would pay for his bride and a written contract was signed sealing the marriage covenant. As far as the bride price went, Jesus paid it himself. He paid it himself when he went to Calvary and gave his life a ransom, a dowry, if you will, to purchase his bride. A mutual contract or covenant was entered into. And of course, in Jewish culture, covenant comes from a Hebrew word that means to cut. That's why they would cut the, kill the animals, cut them in two, and then both parties would walk through the animal parts. It was a blood covenant, okay? So Jesus' dowry was his own blood. This was how he entered into the marriage covenant with his bride. Okay, But Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 reads, and I'm quoting, In him, in Christ, you also trusted, after you heard the words of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee. That Greek word is arabon, and it could be translated down payment or engagement ring. It has wedding marriage connotations attached to it. And what Paul is and he goes on to say that the Holy Spirit was given to us as an engagement ring of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. In other words, when you gave your heart to Christ, you received the Holy Spirit, which was God's down payment or his engagement ring. That he was in earnest. You, why do you give money to buy a house, a down payment? It's called earnest money. It means you're serious. You're in earnest. You're not just playing games. You're serious about this. When God gave us his Holy Spirit, it was because he was telling us, I'm serious. 
I'm not kind of, well, maybe I love you, maybe I don't. Maybe I want to be married, maybe I don't. I am totally committed to you. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you to be my wife fully. Where we're going to live together for eternity. Number three, the arisen, the, betro the betrothal. The betrothal was entered into when we pledged our love and commitment to Jesus. Listen, at the moment of our conversion, remember how we prayed to receive Jesus, yes, as our Savior. Maybe we didn't realize it at the time, but also as our bridegroom. We were making a promise that just as he was serious about marrying us someday, we would, are serious about being with him for eternity someday. And of course, then after our prayer of conversion, where we pledged our love and loyalty to him for the rest of our lives, then we were mikvahed. We were baptized in water. In front of friends and family as a symbol of the marriage covenant we had just entered into with him. To celebrate this stage of their relationship back in Jewish days or back in Jesus' day, to celebrate this stage of their relationship, the couple would take a cup of wine and would both drink from it. Remember what we read in Luke 22, verse 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the, new, is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. This, this new covenant was a covenant of marriage that Jesus was entering into. He paid the dowry with his own blood. And every time we have communion, we are reminded of this promise. As often as you drink at 1 Corinthians 11.25, remember me. Remember me. I'm coming back. Keep reminding yourself that I'm coming back to get you someday. Of course, what is Jesus doing right now? Well, he's in heaven at the Father's house preparing the bridal chamber. Again, after the covenant was entered into, the next thing a young Jewish man would do would be to go to his father's house and prepare a place for them to live. That brings us to our text this morning, John 14. First of all, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. He just told them in chapter 13, verse 33, he was going away and they couldn't come with him. Now he says, don't let your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This was our bridegroom's matan to us, his sacred promise. But when, Lord? <laughs> Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Of course, that then leads to the bridegroom coming for his bride. As we just said, when the father said to his son, Son, it's time to go get your bride, the bridegroom would quickly come for his bride with his closest friends, and they would go running through the streets of Jerusalem, or again, whatever village they lived in, blowing trumpets and shouting with excitement. This, of course, guys, represents the rapture. I will have you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 quickly. You all know it, but let's read it, right? This is John 14. This is talking about the rapture, not the second coming. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. His father said, go get him, son. Go get her. <laughs> so the Lord descends from heaven with a shout. With the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. At the time of the rapture, the marriage will be consummated between us and our bridegroom in the sense that our oneness with our bridegroom Jesus will be complete and permanent. During this time, we will be hidden away from the world in heaven 
while the tribulation period is raging upon the earth, and after the seven-year tribulation period on earth is finished, then our Lord will come back to the earth with his bride at his side, where he will officially present us to the world as his wife. As his wife. The Bible says, at that time, we will reign with him on the earth as his queen. You can check out Revelation 5, verse 10. Guys, when Jesus came to the earth the first time, yes, he came to save us, no doubt about it. But save us to be his bride is the idea. He came to save us that we might become his bride. His whole first coming was about paying the bride price on Calvary's cross. When he ascended back to his father, he sent back to the earth the Holy Spirit who is called the Comforter to gather his bride from all over the world, from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Revelation 5 verse 9. At his second coming, listen to me now, he will return with his bride. Revelation 19. At the rapture he comes for his bride to snatch her off the earth to meet him in the clouds. Take her back to the father's house for the wedding supper. At his second coming, he will return to the earth with his bride to establish his kingdom where she will reign with him on his throne. Guys, right now, right now we are in the period where Jesus Christ is proposing marriage to the people of this world. Think about that. The Holy Spirit has gone into all the world. The Comforter. Our Eliezer, he's gathering a bride. For Jesus Christ, Isaac was a type of Christ. Right now, the Lord Jesus is proposing marriage to the people of this world. Those who refuse, and many will, many think they already have a relationship with him because they've gone to church all their lives. They were baptized and confirmed and have lit candles and prayed rosaries. I was a Roman Catholic. I get to say that because I was there. I had religion. I didn't have a relationship. There's a big difference. So a lot of folks think they're going to get to heaven without a wedding garment on. I mean, you know, they think they're good enough. The Bible says, you try to get to heaven clothed in your own self-righteous works. In the eyes of God, they're like filthy, used, defiled garments. I'll just leave it at that point. And they will be cast out into the outer darkness. That if you receive Jesus Christ right now as your, yes, Savior, but also your bridegroom. Your name is written in heaven. You're on the guest list. In fact, you're not even on the guest list. The guest list, you're, you're the bride. She's not a guest. She's part of the whole deal. A big part. Okay. But those who refuse are cast out into the outer darkness, hell forever. It's not too late to accept Jesus' proposal of marriage. The day, today is the day of salvation. True. But God saved you to get to his real desire, which was to marry you. That's what he's really after. He wants a bride. He's gathering a bride. People say, God, the world is such a mess. Why don't you fix it? God would say, I'm working on it. Right now I'm gathering a people who want to live in my kingdom forever. A world where there is no sickness, disease, uh, crime, injustice, and so on. Evil, hatred, and so on. You want to be a part of that world? Receive my son. If you don't, you're on your own. You're on your own. So this marriage proposal is still active. And anyone in this room or watching on through live stream, if you haven't given your heart to Christ, if you haven't accepted his offer of marriage, Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you get married to him by praying a prayer of commitment. Yeah, we'll baptize you, and then we're all waiting for his return to take us off of this corrupt world to a new home where we're going to live forever. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word and how, Lord, you... We just thank you, Lord, that you have given us such a great... 
word that we might, you know, embrace and so on. Father, we just pray that you would give us grace to keep drawing close to you, keep drawing close to our bridegroom, and that, Lord, you would make us more and more into the image of our Savior, that we would be um, honoring to the family of God as we uh, partake in this very sacred uh, time. We just thank you, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.